morning. Amen. Let's get our Bibles and turn to the book of Colossians. Our Father, I pray for the uh, gift of teaching, Lord. I pray for wisdom. I pray, Heavenly Father, you be with us as we study your word today. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. In Colossians chapter number 1, the Apostle Paul deals with the Gnostics in the book of Colossians. He deals with them in a strong way. If you notice over here, it says in verse number 19, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now, Gnosticism, as I've told you before, is a, uh, a uh, perversion. If a, if a person calls himself a Gnostic Christian, he's perverting the truth of the Word of God, and he's trying to uh, redefine who, who the Lord Jesus is. That's what Gnosticism is about. Uh, I told you how that when Mohammed wrote the Koran, that he had the Old Testament in one hand, the New Testament in the other, and then he had these Gnostic Gospels, like the Gospel of Barnabas and Gospel of Thomas and books like that. And he appealed to them for his Christology, in other words, for his doctrine of Christ. Now, when I say he wrote the Koran, I'm saying it in the sense that um, he's the author of it, and his lieutenants, human agencies, penned it down. But Muhammad is the author of the Koran and the Hadith, which is his own commentary on the Koran. And uh, therefore, the, the Muslim world. The, the Jesus of the Muslim world is not the Jesus of the Bible. You need to understand that. That's very important. Uh, you get into the issue of semantics. And semantics means that when somebody says red, another one says red, your red's not my red. That's semantics. And so when they say Jesus and I say Jesus, we're not talking about the same person. That's very important to understand. If you listen to the news media today, and that's the only, uh, uh, the, the only instruction you get, you are absolutely going to be brainwashed and ignorant of the great truths that we need to know to combat what's happening. Let me explain this. This is 2015, folks. Uh, I've been saved now since 1973. Uh, this is 2016. <laughs> I've been saved since 1973, uh, 43 years. And I have observed, I have observed how much the church now has changed and how much the government has changed, and I'm saying uh, the, uh, the prevailing uh, 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 culture in America and around the world. And I'll tell you the truth. I'll be honest with you this morning. I don't see how we can go much longer before the Lord uh, does something because of, uh, of what's happening here now. We've got, a, we've got a false prophet. And we've got a false prophet, and there's no question about it. And uh, this Pope that has just gone in to the Roman Catholic Church, I would challenge every Catholic, a Catholic who says that you're a Christian, you really believe you're a Christian, listen to what this man says, and you really take a good look at what you believe and what you profess to believe. Pope Francis says the Bible and the Koran are the same. And of course, he, what he, I'm sure what he means by that is that the message of the Koran and the message of the Bible is identical. And no, it's not. And it doesn't take much of an uh, understanding of the Scripture to know that, that the Koran is an entirely different book. For example, uh, I was reading what a professor in, a uh, female professor in the uh, Islamic University in Cairo, Egypt, had to say about what's happening over there in Germany. Uh, how many of you understand what's going on in Germany and what's going on in Europe with these migrants, they're calling them now, they're coming into the country. And back at uh, the New Year, there at that great cathedral in Cologne, they were raping women. They were gang raping them. Did you, did you see any much of that in the news media? You're not going to see much of it. And the reason for that is because the media has an agenda. They want to paint a picture of Islam that's not true. But anyway, 
This woman, this female professor in the Islamic University down there in Egypt says that it's perfectly all right for a Muslim man to rape a woman if she is a kafir, which is an unbeliever, or if they're at war, or whatever other circumstances she gives for that. Uh, there's no problem at all with that. Now, you know, the, uh, the argument in this country has been uh, continually, uh, well, true Muslims are, are people of peace, all right? And so you have the American Muslim definition of what Islam's all about, but it doesn't match the rest of the world. These people came up from North Africa and they came from the Arab countries. They literally came in there and they trashed those countries and they treated those people like dogs. Instead of being thankful for the fact that they had given them sanctuary, they came in there and did that. Now, the point is this, their Koran teaches them that that's okay to do that. Have you ever read that in the Bible? No, you haven't read that in the Bible. You're not gonna get that from scripture. And, uh, but, but in any event, this Pope has an agenda, folks. He has an agenda. He sees himself as the self-appointed leader of the religious world, of the one world government, and the one world religion. He's definitely moving in that direction by here. Listen to this statement. Pope Francis says, we are all seeking or meeting God in different ways. And I saw the video, and in the video he has, uh, the Pope has made, he has a female who says, I have confidence in Buddha. Then he has a rabbi that says, I believe in God. Then he has a priest that says, I believe in Jesus Christ. Then he has an Islamic leader that declares, I believe in Allah. And according to the Pope, all of these are just fine because everybody is doing that which is uh, genuine in their own eyes and uh, it's all all these different paths are leading them to God now I don't know of anything in the world that would be a better uh, anti-Christ religion than that that to me fits the bill it's all leading to God it makes any difference who you worship what you worship what your religion is uh, just as long as you're sincere we're all headed to the same place and that's according to Pope Francis. Remember, he's a Jesuit pope, and remember what uh, the Petrus Romanus, I don't know if there's any stock in it or not, we'll find out, but Petrus Romanus, Peter the Roman, the last pope, according to uh, his book, uh, what's his name? Uh, can't think of his name right now, but he wrote the book, Tom Horn, Tom Horn's book, the Petrus Romanus, and according to the thesis of his book, this pope is the last pope. That's very exciting because I really believe if he's the last pope, then our Lord Jesus is coming soon. I firmly believe this. This man is a false prophet. He is a false prophet. Anybody that tells you that there is any other way apart from the Lord Jesus Christ is a false prophet. Okay, who he is? You make a difference if he's a pope or what? But here's the problem. How about all these 1.2 billion Roman Catholics? Are they just gonna roll over and accept this? Think about it. Think about the arrogance of a church that says that they are the true apostolic church and that they are the successor of Simon Peter and that they're the, that they're the keepers of the faith and that uh, their pope speaks ex cathedra from the, from the chair of Peter and that uh, there is no salvation outside the Catholic church. That's what they've taught for centuries. That's what they still teach. How do you reconcile that? If there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church, yet this Pope tells these people, as long as, it's, as long as you're sincere and you're praying, everything's going to be okay. Do you see what kind of times we live in today? That's the point I'm trying to make this morning. If I could just somehow or another get that over to people. I've never seen anything like this happen like it's happening now. Uh, <coughs> here's a lady by the name of Linda Kimball. How many's ever heard of Linda Kimball? All right, put her name, Google her name, Linda Kimball. And uh, when you Google that name, you'll pull up, she's got a website, and she's the kind of writer that will make you think. She'll make you think. Uh, just an excerpt from the perverse wills of egocentric Westerners. 
Abnormal is gangs of brutal Muslim men evilly groping and raping Western European females while stupefied European leaders either pretend not to notice or blame European women. Abnormal is the perverse hatred, loathing, and death wishing of Western progressives for the civilization that nurtures, enriches, and protects them. Abnormal is the elevation of sodomy, pederasty, bestiality, euthanasia, and abortion to the highest pinnacle of social good. Abnormal is the chastising of the faithful by Pope Francis for not embracing anti-biblical, anti-creation evolution. It's also Pastor Rob Bell claiming to be reinventing Christianity as a neo-pagan Eastern spirituality. Abnormal are thousands of Catholic nuns and some male priests who have become witches and gay druids and shaman. Abnormal is evangelical leader Leonard Sweet using quantum physics to scientifically prove that Jehovah is in everything. That's pantheism. And finally, it is President Obama using our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, the Alpha and the Omega, God Himself to justify the pagan ideal, androgyny, and or gender neutrality. And on she goes. You know what this lady has just said to you? This lady has just said that Everything that is happening, the destruction of Western civilization and the way you see it crumbling around you, and believe me, the church has its part in it. It is guilty, the rotting flesh of this so-called Christian church in America. It is guilty to the bone. She is saying that it is abnormal, that God did not make men like that, and that what you're seeing is a product of of a mind that is a mindset that intends to bring this world to its knees and then present a savior to them, and that savior is going to be the Antichrist. And he's coming. He's coming. The Antichrist is here, folks. He's coming. Uh, she's got quite a few articles. She's got one here about the New Age spirituality, Carl Jung, Abraxas, and Bahomet. And uh, if you'll remember, I told you that Gnosticism, when it gets into the uh, when it gets into the doctrine of how it relates to the church, that many of these churches out here, for example, the Methodist Church, the Methodist Church, so many of them are following Carl Jung, and his name is J U N G, and this man is a this man it was a demon possessed. Uh, individual who tried to merge Eastern mysticism, the occult world of Eastern mysticism, and Christianity. There have been many before who've tried to do this. They've tried to merge Christ and these other, uh, these other religions. And well, you can't do it. One of the things that proves that the Lord Jesus Christ is unique is the fact that you cannot mix him with anybody. <coughs> The things that he says are very clear. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But this, uh, what she's saying here is that this Eastern mysticism, this shamanism, this occultism is so widespread in the churches today that when you walk into the average church, you get a veneer of Christianity, but the truth of the matter is what they're teaching in their Sunday school classes and what the people really believe has nothing to do with Christ. That's why there's no power in them. You have a very thin veneer. And the fact of the matter is the, the veneer is getting thinner by the year. And that's what's going on in these mainline Protestant churches. You remember I told you the other day that... Um, that to 30%, and that's the figure thrown out there, and I don't know if that figure is, is accurate or not, could be more, could be less, of the Southern Baptist churches, the people in the Southern Baptist churches in this country believe that homosexuality is okay. Now, I heard personally uh, Jimmy Carter, former president Jimmy Carter, say when asked, how would Jesus deal with homosexuality? Would he approve of homosexual marriage? And he said, oh, I believe he would. 
He said, I don't have any scripture for that. And I said to myself, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. But here's, here's the thing. You see how that the scripture is just a kind of a, it's a kind of a guideline, but you're really left up to your own devices, to your own mind, to your own choices and thinking that everything's relative anymore, this relativism. So the Bible is not an absolute authority, but it is to me. If the Bible says that it's wrong, it's wrong. But it points out the fact that if 30% of the Southern Baptists, and they're not the only one, believe me, the emerging church movement, you got them all over the place around here. You'll, you, you've driven by four or five on the way to church this morning. These emerging churches, they're either soft on homosexuality or they embrace it. They embrace it. Now, when you begin to do that, folks, you've made a, you've made a conscious decision to throw out the Bible and choose to follow your own decisions and choices. But the fact of the matter is, to boil it down to the bottom line, your God is your belly because you're doing it to survive. That's what it's about. It's not because you've got any convictions about anything. There are no convictions. People, nobody has any convictions today. So, uh, I know that I'm dumping a lot of stuff on you but I want to show you, this woman right here, the more I read her stuff, the more I realize how smart Gail Ripplinger is. We had her here at the church here 20 years ago or so. She came in, spoke to the women. She stayed a couple of days, and I met her personally. And she's one of the sweetest women I've ever met. Good, sweet Christian lady, but she's smart. And she wrote this book, The New Age Bible Versions, uh, I think back in the 80s, somewhere back in there. Uh, this second copyright, 93. Okay, the second printing, 93. The second printing is 93. I don't know when she wrote it. Early 90s, late 80s. But in any event, she lays out the thesis in this book that these new Bibles are corrupted with New Age teaching. Now let me redefine what the word New Age means. Just put Gnostic, okay? New Age, Gnostic, it's, they're the same. There's no difference. New Age Bibles, Gnostic Bibles. And she did her homework. And uh, she's given some good examples in here of what's going on with this. If you remember, I told you, I told you how that Plato taught that there is the monad or the monad, the one, that one spirit or that one essence of the spiritual, whatever he, whatever he defines it to be. And that from that monad, emanations came forth, which were, uh, uh, which were uh, the best way to say it is, emanations from the monad that we can comprehend as, as creatures. One of them is the Christ. One of them is Sophia. One of them is Lucifer. And on it goes. And you can see how then, if you get into this stuff, how that you can get so messed up because he, they have redefined everything. All right? She goes through here, and she goes through the Bible, and she shows you in so many different places how that these new Bibles subtly unless you really know the source of this, what's going on, it's very subtle, the changes that are made. But let me show you something here. And this, of course, if you're gonna, if you're gonna mess up the Bible, what have you done? Uh, John chapter number seven, verse 18. The source of your faith is what, folks? The Bible. John chapter number seven. Verse number, John 7, 18. <coughs> In John 7, 18, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. All right. In verse number 18, His own glory. Well, the new Bibles change His to the one. 
That's interesting. Now, on the surface of it, if you hadn't studied much about Gnosticism, you'd think, well, there's no big deal about that, but it's consistent. For example, uh, John 12, 45. The Lord said, He that seeth me seeth him that sent me. All right. He that seeth me seeth him that sent me. And the New Bible, the NIV says, He who beholds me beholds the one. Capital O N E. What's that telling you? That's redirecting your thinking away from Jehovah and the Lord Jesus to this monad, to Plato, to this Gnostic God. That's what's happening. This is why she calls it the New Age Bible versions. And or you could put forward slash Gnostic Bible versions. Essentially the same thing. Don't you think that's sinister, folks? All of this, all these new versions are under the pretense that they are easy to understand. And then of course if you get into the technocard up technical part of it, they'll come along and say, well, they're based on more uh, ancient manuscripts and blah, blah, and on and on and on it goes, see. I mean, you can get into, a, that's, a whole, that's a whole world out there, manuscript evidence, believe me. That's a whole world. But let's just come down to what you've got in your hand. That book you have in your hand exalts the Lord Jesus Christ personally. And that book you have in your hand exalts God the Father personally. But these new Bibles so slick in the way they do it. Why would they change it to the one? What's the point in that? See, ask yourself a question. Why'd you do that? Does it make it, does it, make it have any more sense to it? Does it help in the reading? Or No. There's reason for that because you're planting the seed. Now, uh, she gives quite a few illustrations here. We'll just use maybe another one here. Uh, John, uh, Colossians 3.10, Colossians 3.10. Now you folks, you've heard me talk about the one so many times in here, so this is nothing new for you uh, to understand that the one is a reference to not, one, not God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, but it's a reference to, to Plato's monad. And the and the pleroma, the fullness of the of all of this of this uh, this manifestations and emanations of, from the monad, Colossians chapter number three and verse ten. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So who's he talking about? The Lord Jesus Christ restored the fallen image of God in man. See. Hebrews 1, that he was in the express image of his person. The Lord Jesus was God, perfect image in flesh. That's who he was. And he being the second man, last Adam, gives to us all of that. That's ours. So what he did, what the Lord Jesus Christ did was restore the fallen image of Adam. Because when Adam fell, his image was tainted. That image was, uh, that image was, uh, was no longer uh, pristine like it had been when God created him. All right, so now we've got here in, in uh, Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 10, uh, the image of him. Now here's what the, the, uh, the, uh, the new Bibles say, the image of the one. Now this is only about three or four references. I've got a good 15. It's on page, uh, if you'd like to get the book, or if you have the book, it's on page 77, uh, Gail Ripplinger's New Age Bible Version. When this book first came out, some of the great prophecy teachers in the country, Christian prophecy teachers, make a lot of money selling books. You know, there's a lot of money in books. And making a lot of money selling books. This book first came out. They were asked, what do you think about Gail Ripplinger's thesis about how that the, the new Bibles uh, essentially are new age versions and one of the great Bible prophecy teachers in America said, I haven't read the stupid thing. I haven't read the stupid thing. There you go. 
Does that tell you anything? Does that tell you anything? It's kind of like the uh, National, what was it, the, uh, the uh, National Review? What's this conservative paper, the magazine that just came out about this thing about Trump? National. The what? National Review. National Review. And they just came out and, and they had, uh, I don't know, 8, 10, 12 scholars who wrote little essays in there about Trump and blasted him. I'm going to ask you one question, one simple question. These great conservatives that wrote these articles in this National Review about Donald Trump, okay, why haven't they done anything about these 10, 20, or 30 million illegal aliens we got in this country? Hmm? Hmm? So much for their conservatism. Exactly. You know what's happened, don't you? When you throw a, a rock down a dark alley, the dog that hollers is the one that got hit. <laughs> Looks like these dogs got hit, doesn't it? I have no respect for them. I really don't. I have no respect. And it's not that Trump is such a great thing, but what he's done is brought up issues. Did you know now that some of the other Republican candidates for president are starting to talk about a wall? Remember what uh, Trump caught when he mentioned about a wall? And he said, I'm going to build a wall and I'm going to make Mexico pay for it. Now we've got other candidates talking about we need a wall. Oh, no kidding. Here's the difference. They're both right. The other candidate is right that we need a wall, but Trump is the leader. That's the difference. And that's what the people see. There has to be a leader, the one who steps out there and does what has to be done, and then the rest of them follow suit. And yet they want to be the leader of this country. But anyway, let's get back off politics and get. I just love to observe stuff like that. I thought to myself, my, you can sure lay into him, but you haven't lifted one finger, not one finger, have you lifted in the last 50 years. And you've got the House and the Senate right now. The Republicans have the House. The Republicans have the Senate. You've had all this for all this time. You haven't done one thing about the illegal uh, immigration of this country. And you haven't done one thing about the health care in this nation, knowing people are being bankrupt, can't get policies, can't get coverage because of pre-existing conditions. And they sit up there and they take care of their rich cronies. That's what the Republicans have done. Do you know why that they didn't want to stop illegal immigration in this country? Because the Republicans and the Democrats are in the same bed together. The Democrats want the votes and the Republicans want the cheap labor. Am I right? Well, what happens when you get the cheap labor? What happens to your job? <laughs> what happens when you have all this stuff moving overseas, uh, NAFTA, GATT, and the rest of it, like Ross Perot said, you'll hear a giant sucking sound of all the jobs that are going to be leaving in America. They did. There was a giant sucking sound and people have been out of work. And Trump says, I'll tell General Motors, I'll have a little talk with them or Ford Motor Company or Nabisco or whoever it is, I'll have a little talk with them and say, now boys, <laughs> you need to be building your car in America. Right. You say, you can't do that. Well, just buckle up and we'll see. <laughs> and then he wants to make America great again. Anyway, don't you think that's deceptive? The one... Now here's another interesting little tidbit, and this is from uh, this is from uh, Gail Ripplinger. It's, it's quite remarkable of her perspective, because I've never read it anywhere else. Chapter 14, she has initiated or in Christ. Now what this has to do is that uh, baptism, according to the occult world. Uh, is an initiation. It's part of an initiation. And whereas if you're baptized here in a, in a Bible-believing Baptist church, you're not initiated into anything. It's an indication of what's already happened for you. If you're not saved when you go into that baptismal pool, that pool's not going to save you, folks. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. But she says that uh, these new Bibles are changing the... Uh, perspective of baptism to uh, initiation. And notice the quote here. She's got a good quote. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Here it is. 
Now this guy is supposed to be Howard Irvin, is the professor at Oral Roberts University. He makes remarks in his book, Conversion, Initiation, the Baptism, and the Holy Ghost. And here's what he says. The initiatory role of water baptism is Christian initiation. Apart from the water rite, the metaphors have little meaning. The ceremony is substantively more than symbolic, it is sacramental. The perception that Pentecostals and sacramentalists share a common world view is correct. The baptism in filling with gift of the Holy Spirit is therefore subsequent to conversion and initiation. The NIV captures the nuance correctly. It, baptism, saves you. Now listen to this, and I'll tell you who said it. After the usual baptism by purification of water, the baptismal font upon entering from which the neophyte was born again and became an adept in the cycle of initiation which was very long, water represented the initial lower steps toward purification. There is another baptism of the spirit of holy light. The NIV changes spirit, Mrs. Uh, uh, Ripplinger says. The NIV changes spirit to light in Ephesians 5, 9. Do you know who said that? Elena Blavatsky, she's a theosophist. She no more believes that the Lord Jesus Christ is her Lord and her Savior and He's the creator of the universe than she'd rise and fly. But her wording is very, very close to what this man over here said, according to what Mrs. Ripplinger has picked out for us in this book. Listen to this statement. Lucifer told Spangler, Am I God? Am I Christ? I am. Christ is the same force as Lucifer, concludes Spangler. Blavatsky agrees. Lucifer or Christ is the bright and morning star. The Hindu's Christ, Krishna, agrees saying, I am the prince of demons. Let me explain something to you here this morning. Instead of piecemeal, let's put it together. How many of you know what the yin and the yang is? Yin, yang, all right? You've got one circle. Okay, that's one. But inside that circle, you've got two separate male, female, okay? Now, these are opposing principles. They represent dualism. What's dualism? Dualism is the belief that there is a divine holy God and that there is a divine unholy God, part of the pleroma. They're both divine. They're both deities. They offset each other but they complement each other because without both of them, you cannot have the whole. All right? This is why that you have these New Age mystics and you have this Gnosticism that says, I am Christ and I am the devil. I am Jesus and I am Lucifer. In other words, I'm both of them. In order for me to be whole and complete, I've got to be both. That's what's going on today. What does that do? That completely confuses the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not evil and wicked and vile and corrupt. He's holy and righteous and undefiled. But you can see their thinking now. Now let's make a practical application of it. Have you noticed how that all these new Bible dictionaries are changing and confounding the identity of Lucifer? Do you know why they're doing that? They're doing that so they prepare you to receive Lucifer. You can receive Lucifer on one hand and Christ on the other hand and merge the two of them together and you'll be complete. That's exactly what's going on today. They call evil good and good evil. They have completely turned everything up on its head. But they've created this system where people accept this stuff. Now how do you get there? Here's how you get there. You get there by spending about 40 or 50 years dumbing everybody down where they don't know the Bible. They don't know anything about the Scripture. Then you begin to feed them, spoon feed them spiritual uh, lessons. And what you are doing is recreating a whole generation of people who are ready to receive the mark of the beast. They don't think like you think. When you talk to the average man out here on the street and you say, you're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ or you're talking about salvation and the new birth. Hey, you better be careful. He may stand there and agree with everything you said, but he doesn't a bit more believe what you believe than a man in the moon. You've got to be wise today. 
when you're dealing with this kind of thing. So you have dualism, which says that there is a good God and a bad God. But you've got to have both of them to complete the whole. So you get this kind of teaching today. These, 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 uh, these uh, uh, emerging church preachers. I'll be good for a while, but then I need to be a little wicked too. Did you know they're preaching that? I've, I've got to be righteous for a while, but on the other hand, I've got, to, I've got to do a few things here because I need both to make me whole and complete. That's the kind of stuff you're getting. Now, where do they get that from? They got that from the thing I'm talking about, dualism, and they got that from the basic foundational teaching of Gnosticism and all of this stuff that Gail Ripplinger pointed out in her book and that I've been trying to bring to you on, on, uh, here on, in Sunday school. Uh, it's easy, real easy, to, uh, uh, to try to stay back where you were 50 or 60 years ago when people went to church and they sang about the Lord Jesus and they sang about the blood and they sang about salvation and everybody knew what they were singing about and everybody was in agreement about what they were singing about and everything, they were all singing about the same thing. But it's not like that anymore. Everything's changed. So you have got to be, you've got to, you've got to be, you got to educate yourself. You've got to be up on what's going on so that you can be prepared when somebody comes and starts talking to you about, oh, listen, the Christ came upon me and I've had this great enlightening spirit come into my life and you wouldn't believe how he has changed my life. And let me just tell you a few of the secrets that you need to know and you can learn what you can, you can walk down the path that I've gone down and you wouldn't believe the freedom that is available to you. And I have felt such a wonderful spirit since I entered into this relationship and on the surface of it, it sounds good, but it's all lies and deception. There's one thing that you, uh, that's a, usually it's pretty well, it's a pretty dead giveaway. You don't hear much of it at all. And I see very little of the word S-I-N. I hear very little of it. In reading Gnostic literature and reading about the New Age movement and all this other stuff, there's very little about sin. And here's, and here's why. If you start talking about sin, then you need a redeemer. And there's only one Redeemer. And there's only one place of redemption. And that's the cross. And Gnosticism doesn't like the cross. And as I've told you before, Mohammed in the Koran, the Koran plainly states that the Lord Jesus was not crucified. Where did they get that from? They got that from Gnostic Gospels. They got that out of the first century. That's where they got it from. It teaches that he was not crucified. Now, what have you done? If you say he wasn't crucified, then you've denied the atonement. Because it was at the cross that the Lord made the atonement. The blood atonement, the blood atonement, the blood covenant was, was ratified at the cross at Calvary. It was brought into being. Without the death of the testator, the testament is not a force. There is no New Testament, folks, until the Lord Jesus Christ goes to the cross and there dies and sheds his blood, and that blood that was shed on the cross is the basis of the redemption of mankind. And it's the blood covenant. It was the covenant of Calvary. But if you deny the crucifixion, what have you got from, what do you have, what are you going to do about your sins? It's okay, just go rape all the women you want to rape. That's what they've got in there, in, the, in that, the idea. There's going to be quite an upheaval over there in Europe. <clears throat> and uh, it, you need to watch what's going on. This thing's not over. It's just started. And uh, these people, they'll start forming their own groups over there in Germany. These young men will get out and they'll start to, they'll get into vigilantism if necessary because the government won't do anything about it. They won't protect their women. And, uh, and that gets down to the core, that gets down to the basic nitty gritty of what you're alive for. If your, mothers and your, if your mothers and your wives and your sisters and your daughters cannot be protected, then what are you living for? If they're walking out on the street and you don't know if they're going to get raped before they ever get home, I mean, what, do you, what, what, what kind of a country do you live in? See, and that's what's happening over there. And uh, something's going to have to give. So uh, that's, uh, that's the blood atonement. And without it, there's no forgiveness of sins. 
And uh, I'm going to stop there. I've got about five minutes left. Anybody have any questions about what we've covered this morning? Yes, sir. No. Right. But you see, they've accomplished their goal. You got your Bible, he's got his Bible, this one's got his Bible. So which Bible's the authority? There is no authority, so it's relativistic in the, again. Relativism. Pardon? Well, absolutely, I believe that. Yes, sir. Brother Bolton? Right, that's Gnosticism. Yeah. I saw an essay the other. I saw an essay the other day on this Star Wars. Uh, what's this last one? Episode called "The Force Awakens." Is that it? Anyway, I saw, it, I saw an essay on that and it compared the gospel of Star Wars with the gospel of Christ, with the Bible. And it's an amazing thing. It's a remarkable at how they have taken the truth of Scripture and twisted it to make it fit their new gospel of Star Wars. And uh, I just quickly brushed through it. I haven't had a chance to do much research into it. But it's, it's, there's a motive behind it. Yes, sir. That's the key. They're willingly ignorant. Second Thessalonians 2, because they loved not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Yes. Yes. Yeah.
Uh, if you will think about what I just said now and take that home and meditate on it about the yin yang, about the two opposing forces making one and how that that is what's preached from the pulpit today. It may, sometimes they may not say it openly, but they imply it. And that's the message. And that's, and that, and they say it's necessary. I remember, uh, I'll shut up when I say this. The son of one of the biggest evangelists, the biggest churches in this country, the son who is notorious. He is notorious. Every church he goes to, he has, he's a serial fornicator. All right, that's a fact. And every church he goes to, a bunch of homes get broken up. But anyway, someone went to him one time and said, don't you feel bad about the kind of life you're living and all these homes you're destroying and families you're breaking up? And he said back to him, he said, great men have great needs. Now think about that for a minute. And you think about it. Great men have great needs. And you'll see the philosophy that goes into that. You'll see... Oh, I'm a great man on one hand, but then on the other hand, I'm this man, and this is what it takes to make me the complete man. That is yin-yang. That is dualism. That is what's preached from the pulpits every Sunday in America. Dualism. And, it's, and, it's, and, it, and it comes straight from Gnosticism. And we'll pick it up again next week. The Lord's not going to accept any of that garbage. No, sir, brother. Oh, no, no, sir. If you be a partaker without chastisement, a bastard, not a son. You can't practice that kind of lifestyle. Uh, say you're born again and then practice that kind of lifestyle and get away with it. Yeah. Yeah. God won't put up with that. If you can do that, if you can live like that and there's no chastisement, you're a bastard and not a son. That's the Bible. You don't know him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Hey. Brother Bruce McLeod, will you dismiss it?